Select lambs for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lentil and the two doorposts with the blood in the basin. None of you shall go outside the door of your house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you down. You shall observe this right as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this observance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, <laughs> but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> nice cheery scripture reading, isn't it? So throughout Lent, I've been doing a sermon series called Misused, Abused, and Reduced. And I've been um, making some suggestive arguments that when we stop paying attention to how we use scripture, how we read it, when we stop doing due diligence and how we study it and how we pray about it, that we lose a lot. The last three weeks, if you've been able to be here, um, I shared with you passages um, out of some of Paul's letters. And, um, and so we, we talked about, and, and when you go back and you realize what he was really saying, passages that have traditionally been used in the last hundred years to subjugate people or to put them down or to hold them back were really radical passages and asking people to yield power and to turn the world on its head. And, it was so much more and so much better than I ever grew up hearing them read in it. And, and, I, and it, it, we lost so much by misusing and abusing those passages. Well, today's passage comes out of the reduced category. People don't like it. They aren't comfortable with it. It's an example. There's plenty of scriptures that fit this category, by the way. Many of them I agree in the Old Testament. Um, and so I could have picked a lot of different ones. I chose this one just because um, it was easier to work with in some ways. But there's a lot of passages that we, we just don't like. We don't like the God it portrays, we don't understand the God it portrays, and so we just go, la 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 la. <laughs> we just like, those, oh, those pages must have stuck together. I, mean, I don't pay attention to that. That's not the God I believe in, or that's not the God I know. Well, that's fair, except it is included in Scripture, which means we have to wrestle with it. So we're going to wrestle. Let's pray together. Oh, wondrous God. <clears throat> We're not really meant to understand all of you, I don't think. You're God. And one thing we're sure of is that we are not. But we give you thanks and praise God for this gift of creation, the gift of your church, for this time when we get to come together and try to be your people, try to learn, try to discern what you would have us do, how you would have us be, and the world you would have us create. And so, God, I ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here. Let these words that are offered up be truly your words. Let the message be your message. Whether we receive it in prayer or song or sermon this morning, let each of us hear something we need to hear. Let us receive a message we need to have and send us forth from this place as your disciples, transforming the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so there are a lot of different terms for passages like this, and, and some of them are actually a little darker than this one, if you can believe it, but 
Um, there's a, there was a whole class in my seminary that you could take called Texts of Terror. And, there, and it was a whole semester of this. I didn't take that class. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, a whole semester that might be a bit much, but I, loved it. I had some friends that took it and they would share with me some of the conversations. And you know, one of the things that came out of that was just how hard it is to wrestle with some of these passages. And um, we started having conversations of would we ever preach some of these? Um, and so you should know a lot of clergy, we have this mindset that there are passages you preach and there are passages that come up in Bible study um, because they're so hard to preach from. Except in my experience, if you only do those in Bible study, you only reach the six people that show up in Bible study. And there's a lot more than six people here on Sunday morning. So, and I was like, well, so over the last couple of, of um, years, I started thinking, well, I better start figuring out how to preach some of these texts. There's going to be a whole lot of people that never, ever get exposed to them because either, you know, because they have to work or they have children, I mean, they have wives or whatever, you know, and Bible study just isn't a part of their lives right now. And so, so this is where some of this um, sermon series I've been sharing with you came from. So a friend of mine, she likes to say that people don't appreciate or respect in our modern lives the God of wrath and the God of power that is portrayed in the Old Testament because that God scares them. And as much as we like horror movies and roller coaster rides and other things that are adrenaline pumping, we don't actually like the idea that there might be a power greater than us that could swoop down at any point and be like, you're done. She says, instead, what we like is teddy bear Jesus. <laughs> we like the Jesus that we can cuddle with, who holds us and gets us through the night, that we can cry our tears on, on the shoulder of, and gives us hugs, and makes us feel loved and comfortable, and we can rest well, and we can recover well. And so what's not to like about teddy bear Jesus? Uh, or teddy bear God, if you will. And I think she's right on point. I, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of the teddy bear God. It's just, that God is great. That God is never upset with me or disappointed. They're like, oh, I'm doing anyway, let's cuddle. Um, you know, and, and so sometimes because we talk so much about God being loving, you know, how many parents do I have in here? People that have parented, whether you were a guardian or biological parent. Okay. So how many of you can remember a moment where you loved your child, but you were very angry with that child? <laughs> okay, good. I like, I, I like that honestly. That's my that's How many of you can remember, for your child's own good, doing something that, from your child's perspective, was mean, cruel, or unfair? How many of you think you were wrong during those moments and the child was right? Oh, there's a little, oh, a couple of you. From I'm time to time, right. in the general, give yourselves an in general, you know. Okay, so, so I can remember many moments with my mother and, and my father, and my mom tended to be the disciplinarian. Um, she didn't need to wait for my father to get home. She took care of it right in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> and there was no one, two, three warning countdown either. It was, boom, there it is, now you're done. So, um, and so I learned quickly. But I can look back now and I can tell that when my mom was the most severe was when I had scared her the most. When she, you know, so I look back at times where I was just an idiot and she was just afraid of the type of person I grow into. And that was usually a talking to, you know. So when I was misbehaving and I wasn't being polite in a restaurant, you know, she didn't beat me in the restaurant. She would lean over and she would say, Amanda Pauline, do we need to visit the ladies' room? That was the only warning I was going to give. When we went to the ladies' room, it was not going to be a fun visit. Was, we were not going to brush our hair and do our makeup. That's not what was going to happen to the ladies' room. So that was when I was just being stupid. But I think of times where I played in the street when I wasn't supposed to, where I ran with a jump rope when she told me repeatedly not to, and I fell and tore up my leg, just like she told me I would. I think of the times where I broke curfew and then tried to pretend like my watch was broken and that's why I was 15 <laughs> minutes late. And those were, the, I think of the times where it didn't occur to me to call her and tell her where I was because I told her I wouldn't be home and I thought that was okay, and she was terrified. Those are the moments that I can remember and I look back on, and they were awful. <laughs> because when I did get home, or when she did get a hold of me, they were the, some of the most severe punishments, and I realized it's because she was afraid for me. I don't know if all of the powerful acts that God does in the Old Testament are always because he's afraid for his people, but they often have that kind of note to them. And I have to tell you that I think it's important, particularly during this time of Lent, when we're recognizing the most powerful thing God ever did in the history of the world, which was to limit his own power and come to earth as, human, as a human and die on a cross and then conquer death and be really not. 
Um, with Pharaoh being afraid that the Israelites, who he is now made into slaves, will have an uprising against him. And he knows that there's going to be an uprising that's likely to come from the men and not the female slaves. And so he says to the midwives, if, a, if one of the Israelite women has a girl, that's fine. But if she has a son, I want you to kill it. And the midwives just don't pay attention to that. They're like, blah, 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 blah. And, and then when Pharaoh notices that boys are still being born, the midwives tell him, it's a, great, it's a great line, they say, well, see, the Israelite women are so strong that they have their babies before the midwives can even get there, and then it's just too late. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> So then he, um, and he tolerates that for a little bit, then he gets worried again, and so he sends out his soldiers to go house to house in the areas that the Israelites lived in, and any ch male child two years or younger is to be killed and thrown into the Nile River, which was known to have um, critters that would take care of you if you, and plus you, if you couldn't swim, you would drown. And so Moses' mother, <coughs> afraid of this, puts him in a basket and sends him in a basket down the river, and he floats along, and he ends up in a private area where Pharaoh's daughter is hanging out, and she sees the baby and falls in love with the baby, and then very conveniently so, Moses' sister, who's been sort of, you know, running by the banks, keeping an eye on the basket, says to Pharaoh's daughter, hey, I know an Israelite woman that just had a child, and she'd be more than happy to come be the wet nurse, The Pharaoh's daughter's like, perfect, and so then Moses' mom does get to come and help raise him, and then when it sort of skips forward a little bit, and we find Moses is an adult, and, and he's sort of um, an adopted son into Pharaoh's household. So he's the one Israelite in the world that has any kind of, of, of sense of power. Um, he has a relationship with Pharaoh. He's enjoying the freedoms. Um, he's, being, he's treated as a, as a son. And then one day he sees uh, one of the Egyptians um, attacking an Israelite, and Moses steps in to stop that, and Moses ends up killing the Egyptian. And then he knows his life is forfeit, so he flees. And he runs into the wilderness, and he spends some time there, and he makes new friends, and he gets a wife, and that's all great. And then one day he's wandering along, and there's this burning bush, which caught his attention, as you might imagine, because the bushes are being consumed by the flames instead of a voice that's coming out of the bush. And I don't know about you, but I stop and talk to the bush. <laughs> so he has a little conversation with the bush, which turns out to be the voice of God. And God says, I need you to go back, because you're going to leave my people. And Moses says, no, absolutely not. Um, and God says, no, no, really, I need it. And Moses says, no, I'm not qualified, I don't speak well, send my brother Aaron, and and God says, no, really, you, and you can take Aaron along as, like, your buddy, but no. And Moses says, oh, okay, so off he goes. So he goes back, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, you <laughs> <"Get right." laughs> You're a funny little man. Ouch, yo. Um, and this starts a back-and-forth conversation that we're coming in at the end of in today's scripture, in which God gets increasingly frustrated with what he calls, what's written in scripture, as the hardened heart of Pharaoh, that, that Pharaoh has no compassion for God's people, and he begins to send plagues. Um, and so he you has know, the plague of the flies and the gnats, and we've got the, the water, he turns all the water into blood, and, um, and so there's lots of great movies that do that well. This is the final plague. So there's been a number of opportunities at this point for Pharaoh to acknowledge that God is powerful, and then when God says, let my people go, your answer is yes. And that's not been Pharaoh's answer. And my value of Moses is angry. So the beginning of the passage I shared with you today was Moses saying to him, like, that's it. You're done. All right? So here's what's going to happen. Every firstborn, every firstborn, not just yours, every firstborn in the Egyptian household. And typically this is interpreted as, as meaning firstborn males, but you, know, you could argue either way. It's just a firstborn child. Um, I went back and I did some studying on this passage because it's really hard, and I read a number of um, commentaries and I watched some videos done by rabbis because I thought, I wonder how do, the Jew how do our Jewish brothers and sisters read this? Because they don't have teddy bear Jesus. They don't ever get this. So how do they understand this God that's still very real for them? They don't, you know, and, um, and I went back and he made the point, one of the rabbis I was watching made the point that in his interpretation and his belief, um, that one of the reasons it included everybody is because God was not going to leave a single loophole for Pharaoh to get through and doubting the power of God. So it wasn't going to be that foreigners did that foreigners that were busy, that their firstborns weren't striking because then it could be the foreigner's God, and Pharaoh could use that loophole. It wasn't going to be that it was just Pharaoh's household because they could just be that Pharaoh's son got sick. It wasn't it was going to be this undeniable action that there was no way the other side of it that Pharaoh would be able to not acknowledge the power of God and do what God was telling him to do. Well, action achieved. 
But he wants to spare his own people, and apparently this plague of death that he's sending doesn't, doesn't have a, a distinction um, from a visual standpoint. And so what he tells them is to slaughter a lamb and then mark their doorway, the blood of the lamb, and, and that's how this plague of death will go to pass over. And then make sure you don't leave your home, because if you leave your home, I can't help you, you'll, you'll be stricken just the same way. And, and this becomes what we know as the Passover, which I want to just remind you, because we're going to come to it in a little bit, that what we think of as the Last Supper is Jesus and his disciples celebrating, celebrating and remembering this scripture passage. It's the Passover meal. And the at the Passover meal, they tell the story of the Exodus, which begins with the story of the plagues. And, begin, you know, they escape into the desert, and they have a lovely chase scene, and part of the waters and all the fun stuff that we like. But to think about it, on the night before Jesus gives himself up, he and his disciples have gathered together, as they are supposed to do, to remember this scripture passage. Which is why I was drawn to it in the Easter season. I thought, That's, that can't possibly be coincidence that Jesus would happen to die right in this moment, that they're remembering a passage that is about blood and death and sacrifice. It seems to be a pretty strong connection there. I don't know if I can make you like this passage. It's not really my goal. I want to give you some truths that I see out of it because it's not useless. Even if we don't fully understand God, which I don't really ever plan to achieve that, even if we don't fully understand what God is doing or what God does not mean there isn't something for us to use in those biblical passages. So first of all, let's start with that God is powerful. Boom! Mic dropping God, right? Like, don't mess with me. I have the wrath. I've got the power. This isn't the only place he zaps people, right? So one of my favorite stories is, um, is not a well-known one, but they're, they're moving the Ark of the Covenant, and they've got it on this cart, and it, and it rocks and it shakes, and one of the guys goes to just keep the ark from falling off, which you think would be a good thing, and God zaps him dead. Poof! Pile of dust struck by light. Done. Out. Like, wow. <laughs> when he says, don't touch the ark, and he's don't touch the ark. I thought my mother was me. <sighs> you know, and so, so this isn't the only place. But so first of all, I think it's very important for us to remember to acknowledge the power of God. In some ways. It also gives us great insight into what sin causes in our world. So the sin is not following the will of God. That is the basic definition of sin. We like lists of to-dos and not to-dos, and, and that's fine. But really, it, the basic definition of sin is do the will of God. And in this passage, the will of God is let my people go. He's very clear about this. He says it more than once. There's, there's, no, there's no loophole to that. And so Pharaoh is sinning in the most grievous of ways because he's not following the will of God. He is not allowing God's chosen people to be free. Instead, he's keeping them enslaved. He's owning other human beings, and he is using them as chattel to build his palaces and his kingdoms and things like that. They have no value to him except as these beings that just make his will happen. So to me, it's a, it's a passage that really captures sin. We are reminded that the punishment of sin is death. That comes up in the story of creation. It comes up in many of Jesus' conversations. There's a reason we talk about Jesus conquering sin and death. Because the consequence of sin was that you would die. And this passage really reinforces that. The other thing that I struggle with, though, in this passage that I think a lot of people do, is what did everybody else do wrong? Right, so I appreciated the rabbi's perspective that God didn't want there to be any loopholes. That seemed like a pretty selfish reason in my mind for God to strike down everybody. Like, I understand being mad at Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the guy in charge. What did all the other Egyptians do? What did the cows do to him? You know, what did the, the other types of slaves that Egypt had do? Like, I, you know, that's, that's always been my struggle. What did the innocent, and what about the children that get wiped out? You know, some of them would have still been infants. God is killing babies in this passage. What could they have possibly done wrong? I spent a lot of time in prayer with that, and I finally got a very interesting answer. And I don't know if it came directly from Pagnot, but I was praying, and all of a sudden it occurred to me, Amanda, since when does sin only convict the guilty? 
Since when in the history of the world has sin not victimized the innocent? The innocent always pay for our sins. Think of the drunk driver who has allowed themselves to become so intoxicated that they have no control over their actions and no awareness um, that allows them to drive safely, and yet they get in a car, which is the same as loading a gun and firing it into the air. And they're driving along and they get into an accident and three people in the other car die and the drunk driver walks away without a scratch. How many times have we heard that story? What did those people do wrong? Sin harms the innocent. Think of the stories of war. How many stories do we know of civilians that have been caught up in bombs or IEDs or drone strikes that were a mistake that actually got dropped <coughs> on a school instead of the military target or all the way back into the other wars when you know the, the battle of the Civil War was played out on your farmhouse front lawn and people died in their farm homes because there was nowhere to escape to because the bullets would penetrate their walls and they die in their homes in the middle of a battle and spilled out onto their farm. Sin victimizes the innocent. And one of the things that it reminds us is that when we tolerate sin, when we choose to participate in it and not object to it, we become just as guilty as the perpetrators. And I started thinking about the plagues of the modern day and the damage they are doing to the innocent. I started thinking about the plagues of poverty and those that are suffering because I started thinking about the fact that Somehow we can't figure out how to feed people in our country, but we can, and I'm a big football fan, so don't get me wrong, but we can figure out how to pay a, a football, a single football player, $400 million over the next decade. What can we do? And I'm not saying he won't do good things with it, and I'm not blaming him, it's not his fault that that's how society has chosen to reward him, but when we participate in that, when we don't demand that we do something different, we become just as sinful. And so instead of people, instead of building schools or shelters or, or free medical centers that can help people, we're, we're watching football. And I love football hall. I want it to continue, but, and I don't know how to fix that just yet, which is part of my frustration, but it certainly confirms to me the conviction of this passage that the, the, the plague of greed, the plague of power, the plague of racism, the plague of sexism, the plague of genderism, the plague of ageism are all upon our society. And it is the innocent. It is those that have done nothing wrong. Those of you that, are, that have been victims of ageism, what did you do wrong except live? Why, why are we punishing the senior citizens of our society for living, <laughs> for not dying sooner? How did they not become a priority? Why do we have senior citizens who work their whole lives living in abject poverty, not being taken care of, not being watched over, not being cared for? And on the other end of it, why do we have children that find themselves in the same place? How is it that we can fund so many things? How is it that we can figure out how to end polio and, and we have amazing medicines and things that we can send, you know, things to the moon and and things to Mars. But we can't figure out how to give everybody clean water. Surely we have the brain stamina to do that. That we can't, we can figure out how to, to fund, you know, sports and music and fashion, but not schools. There are plagues upon our society and let me tell you, the innocent are dying. And if they're not dying physically, they're dying spiritually and mentally and emotionally. The forgotten of our country. Forget the rest of the world for a moment. We don't even, I mean, I, just in our own country. How is it we can do so many things and yet not solve some of these problems? We are our own plague of the firstborn. We are the plague. Because it doesn't matter that I'm paying my taxes, or it, it, I'm tolerating, I'm participating in a society where innocent are being harmed. It's called societal sin. It isn't that any one of us are bad or evil or have done something wrong, but somehow we cannot figure out a way to unite enough together to say, this isn't the world we want. And until we do that, the innocent will fall victim to sin, which God displayed very clearly in the plague of the first book. The innocent always suffer, not just the guilty. 
And then I just want to point out that I do think it's a foreshadowing event. You know, there's never just one thing happening in a scripture passage. And I, I still don't like the God that has to make this point. But I understand that God doesn't know another way to make the world listen in this moment in time. He tried everything else. He sent Moses again and again. He tried plagues that didn't kill people. Again and again, God gave moments and moments, and people hardened their hearts, and they said, we're just not interested in working harder to change. What if you take our slave people? Who will build our buildings? Who will clean our floors? Who will make our meals? God, you can't possibly ask us to let your people go. How in the world would we have, we have to do that ourselves? <gasps> Fast forward, you know, a thousand years or so, and the Israelites are still a conquered people. God's chosen people are now <coughs> under the, the prerogative of Rome, a new empire, the new Egypt. And they're still being relegated to a slave society. <coughs> they're still substandard citizens. <coughs> and God says, I'm going to send a new plague of the firstborn. So this time, I'll kill my own firstborn. Because nothing else seems to work. Nothing else seems to change your minds. Nothing else seems to motivate and inspire you, so I will give it to you. I will send my son. And this time, my son will die. And all of you. To wonder, would we understand that story without this one? Would it mean as much? I don't know. I don't know if you'll like this passage. I'm not sure we're meant to like it. I encourage you to learn from it, to consider what it tells you in your heart, to let it convict you. To consider how we tolerate sin, to consider how we let the innocent die, and to ultimately consider the true gift during this Lenten season that is Jesus Christ. That we not take for granted that it meant nothing to God, because God is God. That it meant nothing for Jesus Christ to die. That no pain was experienced. That no sacrifice was made. That it was just simple. Or that it's the way it had to be. That God could have continued to do this. God could have continued to send plagues upon us. And instead, God said, I'll just plague myself. Because I really, really love you. And I really, really want you to have more. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to